I'm hitting the button. And there we are. Welcome, podcasters, to this advanced podcasting strategies call. I'm Dave Jackson. I'm the head of podcaster education, and I'm looking to have some fun today. I hope you are too. We are here to talk about growing your podcast audience. And so we've brainstormed some ways. I'm I'm digging up things I haven't thought about in years that you'll be like, really? And I'm like, yep, this is work. So we're going to get to that. Now, along the way, if you have questions, I'll be stopping every now and then to see if there are any questions. If you use the little chat down there, what we want you to do is add a cue. That way the awesome Libsyn team can kind of flag those. So I make sure that those don't uh, go unanswered. And of course, the first question always is, hey, is this being recorded? To which I go, we're podcasters. Of course it's being recorded. Yes, so this will be recorded and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And speaking of the YouTube channel, tomorrow, Tangia Renee Estrada, tomorrow at 2 Eastern, has a great presentation. And if you haven't checked out the Libsyn YouTube channel, what are you waiting for? It's free and there's tons, I mean, just tons of information. Have you done the thing yet where you're watching YouTube on your TV in the living room? That's great fun. You could pop some popcorn and have a Libsyn night and just kick back with Elsie and Brian and everybody else on the channel and grow your show. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm so glad you're here. Don't forget to ask questions along the way. Let me explain where we're going to go because we've got a ton to cover today. And so the first thing I want to uh, mention, I forgot to mention, I mentioned our YouTube channel, but we want to talk about, this is with, when we talk about YouTube today, that is YouTube. Yeah, you can go to a, a webinar or presentation from YouTube. So it's elevating your podcast with uh, YouTube podcasts. It's a walkthrough. So if you're new to the whole YouTube, how do I turn my YouTube into a podcast, that whole nine yards, that is going on. It's April 11th at 2 p.m. So how cool is that, that we get to not just talk about YouTube, but actually get to talk to YouTube. So that's going to be great fun on April 11th. So and that is when you do, you see there's a register button. So you do have to register for that. But I know I'm going to sign up for that. And uh, we'll be talking about YouTube podcasting today. We'll be talking about Spotify podcasting. We're going to talk, well, let's just get to that slide, shall we? I've got a slide that's going to explain everything that we're going to do. And so the, if I can get my mouse to work, there we go. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to, first of all, talk about, is my podcast ready for the public? And then figuring out what is working. There's an old marketing joke I'll fill you in on and how we can solve that. Uh, the phrase you need to remove from your vocabulary. Please quit saying this and I'll explain why. I've got uh, proof for that. And then my favorite mistake. I made a mistake that was like, holy cow, are you kidding me? And I'll explain how it was the best mistake I've ever made. Uh, best practices for both being interviewed and doing interviews. We'll talk about that because that's a way you can grow your audience. And we're going to talk about some guerrilla marketing. You'll just go bananas for it. Drum roll there. Got it. All right. So moving off the uh, dad jokes, the first thing we're going to start with here is podcast value is content plus delivery equals value. So what I mean by this is you could have amazing content. I'm going to tell you how to turn 50 cents into 50 million, right? Amazing content. And if it's delivered in a way that the sound is bad. You're all over the place. You spent the first five minutes of your podcast talking about Mr. Whiskers because he's just a rascal of a cat. Yeah, that's not as much value to that. Though You have this great content and you're just stripping away the value through your delivery. Likewise, you could have mm, content, but it's delivered with clear, crystal clear sound and you've got amazing lights and cameras. And it's, if it's, again, you have to deliver value. So that's the first thing that we have to talk about is does your podcast deliver value? And then when we talk about growing 
your podcast, well, then we take that value and we multiply it by smart promotion. And if you think about it again, if your value is zero, but you've got, uh, I don't know, a plane in the sky with your your domain and you've got a mural on the wall in downtown and you're going everywhere and QR codes aplenty. Yeah, if all that's going to do is help the world know that your show needs a little more work quicker. Whereas if you do have great value in your podcast, but you don't tell anybody, it's just going to be a trickle. So have confidence in your have confidence in your content and then go out there and market it. So we're going to talk about that as we go along. So this is uh, my favorite. It's my, if somebody said Dave's greatest hits, this is one of them. What makes a good podcast? So we're just going to breeze through this because I hit this in every kind of presentation I do. What makes a good podcast? It boils down to this. You make people either laugh or in some cases you make them cry. Hopefully you make them think. Some people will tune in to hate you. So groan. They're like, ah, that guy again. Or Maybe you are educating people, or maybe you're just giving them something to turn their brain off, just to entertain me. I don't really, you know, just, just to entertain me. And the bonus is if you can do more than one at a time. So if you can make me laugh while you educate me, if you can, you know, make me think while you're, you know, educating me, then we've got a winner on our hands. The more of these you can do at once, the better your show is going to be. And I, it's true. If you're not making people laugh, cry, think, groan, educate, or entertain, there is a word for you, and that, of course, is boring. Don't be boring. Please don't be boring. So with that, is your podcast ready? And one way you can do this is not just asking for feedback, because so many people, they ask for feedback, and they make it very generic. They're like, so what do you think of the show? And people go, it's good. So when you ask really generic questions, you get really generic answers. So we want to ask very specific feedback when we're trying to figure out if we can make our show any better. So right, and so I have the picture there, we're buffing out the rough spots. And so what you can do is give somebody a specific episode to listen to, because we want specific feedback. And then when they're done listening to it, and I advise that you do this with someone that you're not related to. I know some people are like, no, no, my mom will tell me the truth. But many times friends and family, they will comment on things like, oh, look at you with your, your look at the microphone. And, you know, mom's like, oh, you're so professional. Look at you, right? And they're not talking about the content. They're talking about your gear because it's hard to look at someone and go, you know, that uh, you had me at the beginning, but about halfway through it became a snooze fest. Sometimes family and friends are not the people that have the courage because they, they love you. And you're like, yeah, but I'm trying to make this really, really good. So by asking specific questions, and hopefully you can get people, you can go to a Facebook group, or if you have an email list and say, look, I'm starting this podcast, it's for you. And if you can help me make it better, you are going to benefit. And who doesn't want to benefit? So say here, listen to this episode and then ask them some questions. Say, hey, did you listen to the whole thing? And if they go, mm, yeah, mm -mm. and then you go, okay, great. Well, you know, how far did you get? And if they go, well, you know, there's, there are good reasons and bad reasons because you could say, well, then why didn't you, you know, why did you stop? And on one hand, they might say, well, I only made it about, you know, 60% of the way through. And that doesn't sound great. But if they say, yeah, well, I was listening to it on the way to the dentist and I was at the dentist, like, you know, it was a 15 minute drive and your podcast was 30 minutes. So it's not always bad news, but by asking specific questions, you can get specific answers. And then the, the one question you want to ask that is sometimes kind of hard to ask because sometimes we don't like the answer is okay. On a scale from one to 10, where nine and 10 is, I'm going to tell everybody I know, how likely are you to share it with a friend? And so when you get nines and tens, you're right on where you want to be. When you get down to seven and eights, those are kind of, uh, yeah, maybe. But if you get like a seven or a six or a five, yeah. Now when we need to go back to those questions, it goes, so why did you quit? Is it the, is it the content? Is it the delivery? What's, where are we missing something here? 
or maybe the person that's listening just isn't your target audience. But we want to have that really, really high with people sharing the show. We'll talk about why that's important a little later. But those are the questions that sometimes they're a little hard to ask because we're worried about the answer. But in the end, if we're going to spend time marketing the show, if we're really going to to go out there and we're going to make some marketing material, we're really going to start telling everyone we know, it doesn't make any sense if we're getting fours and fives on that score because we're just not ready yet. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. Um, one of my backgrounds is I'm a musician. And we'll we'll talk about this a little later. We spent, in some cases, six months in the basement before we even went live. Now, that's a whole different ballgame. I don't think you need six months in the basement to get your podcast right. But the, the bottom line is you want to polish it up a little bit. All right. So then, again, I just mentioned this. So if you think about it, authors have rough drafts. Uh, when I wrote my book, it went through five rough drafts. And every time my publisher sent me a new one, I'm like, are we not done with the edits? And be like, nope, here's another one. If you're a actor, they have dress rehearsals. If you're an athlete, they have preseason. And I just mentioned uh, musicians spend a fair amount of time in the basement making sure they got everything right. So if you've if you're brand new to podcasting, definitely do this. If you've been podcasting for years but never did this, you might want to think about it. I'll tell you later about my favorite mistake. But the one thing I see people, when we're talking about how do I grow my audience, we would all agree that blogs, which is just a text-based post on your website, attracts Google. And I realize you're kind of like, well, duh, words. And that's what Google likes. Google likes really good words. So all I'm saying is, have you ever seen your episode description that you type into Libsyn? And you're like, in today's show, we do this, and we talked about this, and here's my interview, and blah, blah, blah. Just copy that and put it on your website, and then slap a player on that. Voila, your podcast is now a blog with a player at the top. Now, why is that important? Well, here's the deal. A, so many people, in some cases, if you have your own website, don't point people at the Libsyn site. I mean, we'll take your SEO by all means. No, put that on your website. And then what happens is now you have those really good words that describe the episode. And so you show up in Google and people click on it and they go over to your website and they go, oh, wow, there's a, a play button here. I wonder what that does. Click play. They start listening. Meanwhile, Google's going, that's funny. Every time I send somebody over to Dave's site, they're there for like 12 minutes. That must be really good information. So what do they then do? They start sending more people to your website. But if you don't have anything on your website, then Google can't find you. And I'm just like, look, you've already typed this description over in Libsyn. Just copy and paste it into a post in WordPress or whatever you're using, Wix or et cetera, et cetera, and make it easy for Google to find you. It's super easy. And we're talking copy and paste here. So maybe 15 seconds to do that. And it's an easy way because we all get excited. You know, YouTube is the number two search engine. It is. You know what the number one search engine is? Google. You know what it likes? Websites. So make sure there's some information there on your website to attract Google. And I just see a lot of people that forget the words. They'll put, uh, I just saw someone this morning that had just put, it. you went to their page and they had all their episodes. So it was just like, Episode player, episode player, episode player, episode player, and you could see them. But in terms of SEO, that had zero, zero, you know, Google juice on there. So make sure to, to put the words there on your website to attract Google. Moving on, shall we? Uh, this is an old marketing joke. 50% of my marketing works. I just don't know which half. <laughs> well, there's a way that you can figure this out. And so one of the things I want to talk about before we go to the next slide, I'm going to mention a bunch of companies today. None of these are official Libsyn like, oh, Libsyn has, you know, donned the, the app of choice. Now, these are all just, if you Google any of these, you can find them. Some of them I've used, some of them I haven't, but I just want to make sure this is not an official Libsyn endorsement on that. But you can figure out what's working by using what are called either link shorteners or link trackers. So there's bit.ly, there's rebrandly. I personally use switchy.io. That's on AppSumo, by the way, at the moment. Uh, tiny URL. And what these do 
is you can say, all right, here's the link to my website, because I'm going to send people back to my website, and it, it gives you a different link. And I use that link on, let's say, threads. And then I go, here's the same link, gives me a different link. I put that one on Twitter, and then I put this one on Instagram. And that way you can figure out, well, I can see I got two clicks from, I'm sorry, Twitter slash X. I've got five from threads and three from, you can figure out what's working and what not. I'm going to put this link in my newsletter so you can see what's working. So you can do more of that and do less of the stuff that's not. Because the last time I checked, only 24 hours in a day. So again, if you just Google link shorteners, there are a ton more than that. So this is just a quick screenshot. You can use uh, switchy.io, and I'm sure they all do this, but I kind of made a little link tree looking website for myself. And so I can see how many clicks each one of those buttons got. So I'm not guessing what is, you know, what's resonating with my audience. I can see. Now that took all of, I don't know, 10 minutes to make, if that. And there are other ways to do this. This is brand new. This is episodes.fm, where again, if you say you go over, you find your show, and it's like, here are all the links to that show on all these different platforms. And so I could see really easily where you could say, oh, I'm just going to send people to that. And absolutely, you could. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's figure, like, what are the pros and cons? So if I send people, and again, this is not an official endorsement, uh, episodes.fm, super easy, zero SEO for me. But if I put those same links, because you can go over there and get the links and copy and paste those on my website, takes a little longer. But now when I say, hey, if you want to follow the show, just go to mywebsite.com slash follow. Now I get the SEO and I can see what's going on because I'm going to make each one of those links trackable. So I can see, well, I see where it's odd that most of my audience is in, let's say, Apple Podcasts. So if I'm going to stress out over how show notes look, I'm going to go look at them in Apple Podcasts because according to my stats, that's where most of my audience is, is looking at things. So it's really up to you as always, but uh, that's a new option that just come on board. And there are a few of these. Podlink is another one. I'm always like, yeah, I like the idea. Do this on your website because when we drive more traffic to our website, we drive more traffic to our podcast. Now, another one, and I realize you're like, email, email, old man. I'm like, yes, email. Because everything I study, whether it's somebody building a small business, somebody building a podcast, somebody building even a YouTube channel, they will mention email list. And one of the things that people talk about, especially with ratings and reviews and Apple, and I get it, ratings and reviews are social proof. For the record, from Apple, they do nothing to advance you up the charts, zero. But it, they're, they're social proof. And who really likes that social proof? are advertisers. When you go, look, I have an engaged audience. Look at how many reviews I got. That's absolutely true. You know what else makes advertisers just giddy? Giddy, I tell you, is when you say, look at how big my email list is. Because those people you can touch over and over with a link to their product. So email is, and a, the other beautiful thing about an email list is most of them you can start for free, whether it's MailChimp, MailerLite, um, not constant contact, convert kits, another one that has a free plan. So you can start free. And then as your list gets built uh, bigger, you might have to pay some money for that. But if your list is getting bigger, then maybe you can start advertising in your email list. So, but how do you get people to sign up for your email list? Because I don't know about you, when I woke up today and I'm like, oh, Wednesday, oh, hope I can find some newsletters to sign up for today. Mm, yeah, no, most of us don't do that. We're looking for a reason to sign up. And that's where you'll hear the phrase lead magnet. You'll say, oh, you have to have a lead magnet. Well, again, you don't have to write war and peace here. It, an easy way to do this is go into Libsyn, go into your stats, and you can sort your, your episodes by number of downloads. Look at your top 10 episodes and go, how can I make some sort of summary? Or maybe it was... Uh, you know, Brian over at uh, the Cinema Psycho Show, and he's got, all right, I just gave you five movies that you need to watch before they get off Netflix. If you want an additional five, well, go sign up for the newsletter, right? Something that your audience wants. For me, uh, I, myself and Elsie, we do shows about podcasting, so maybe we've got a podcast checklist or something of that nature, something your audience wants, but it doesn't have to be crazy. 
I have one. I looked at, uh, if you look at your Google Analytics, which you have on your website, of course you do because it's free. I could see my top 10 pages. And one of them was how to take a phone call on a podcast. And I was like, phone call? Like how it was 1997? What are we talking here? But nonetheless, it was a popular page. And all I did is I had a little box that said, would you like this article as a PDF? Like how lazy can you get? But I did, and I had a number of people, not a ton, but I had a number of people like, yes, I would like this article as a PDF. So try anything. But that was when I was like, this is never going to work. And then it did. So a league man, it doesn't have to be anything super crazy. But you want that email list because the, the beauty of an email list is when you want to try something new in your podcast, but you don't want to do it live. Now you've got a group of people that have said, I like your stuff. And you can say, hey, I'm thinking of doing this episode about blank. What do you think about it? So now we're we're cultivating that relationship and that conversation with our audience. Stop saying find my show. And this is why. I've got a couple examples of this. But so many people are like, just find me wherever you find your podcast. Well, that is a show I do. It's called the Podcast Rodeo Show. So I typed in the exact name of the show into i believe that is apple podcast yes i think that's that one and it didn't show up at all and so uh, another example is if you type in the feed which is the name of lipson show uh it doesn't show up and but things like nfl draft does and i'm like how does that even show up for the feed so not the search is horrible but at times it's not great and so when you say, find my show wherever you find podcasts, and your audience comes over and they're like, well, the name of the show is The Feed, and it doesn't show up, how long are they going to go, well, whatever, never mind, I'll just, I'll just listen on the website, or I'll just listen later, or whatever. So you want to stop saying, find me, and instead, where are we going to send people? You guessed it, back to your website. Now, when you have links on your website for you know, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and whoever else you want to add there. Well, A, now you can reinforce your brand and say, hey, go to my website.com slash follow. And it's right there. So now we're we're hitting them with our URL so they can remember that. And they don't have to find you. And if they like the show, they can share that link with their friends, which of course boosts your SEO. So not that it's a crime. If you want to continue to say, find me wherever you find pod, you can, but you're missing an opportunity to reinforce your brand and make it easier for people to sign up. And you're like, but how do I make a link to Spotify on my website? Well, if you go in, I found the feed in Spotify and there's those three little dots there next to follow. So I'm looking at the show, not an episode. And I clicked on the three little dots You'll see there's a button there that says share. And when you click on that, it says copy show link. You copy that link and you can then put that on your website. Now, here's something to think about. If you've never used snippets in Libsyn 5, it's amazing. You could make a snippet that says follow the show and just type Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and whoever, and then go in and paste that link into that snippet and then go and get the one for Apple. And I'll show you how to do this in just a second. And then in every episode, you simply get done typing your show notes and you're like, oh yeah, snippets, follow the show, and it just types it right back in there for you. So you only have to find the links once and then you can just fill them in every week with your snippets. So this is how it looks in uh, Spotify. This is how it looks in, in this case, that is podcasts with an S, podcastconnect.apple.com, your Apple dashboard. So you click on the name of your show and you'll see there's a copy button in the bottom right-hand corner. If you're on Amazon, you can find your show and they have that weird little three dot looking thing. And you click on that and one of the options is copy link. And again, you copy that, you paste it on your website. You could even put it into, you know, whatever you want to. If you use Evernote or NoteJoy or Apple Notes, you could, you know, it's something you want to keep handy because people are going to go, oh, where should I find your show? And you direct them, of course, to your website. And you can even make like a slash follow page. And there's Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and whoever else you want to put. So keep uh, putting people to your website. And then speaking of your website, if you have your own website, uh, Libsyn, when you sign up, doesn't know if you have a website or not. So we put the Libsyn site 
in the website URL. And if the goal of the show is to drive more traffic to your website, then take out that Libsyn feed or Libsyn uh, URL and then put in yours. That way again, because in certain apps like an Apple, there's actually a button when you go to your listing that says website. And you can click on that and it'll drive traffic to your website. Because the bottom line is we want to improve our SEO ranking. We want more people to find us on Google because then we can get Google to point at our website and our website can point to the podcast or our email list or whatever else we want people to do on our website. But as, as much as we all get giddy about YouTube, as we should, it is the number two search engine. Don't forget about the number one search, in, search engine, which is Google. All right, now my favorite mistake. This was so much fun. So I had, uh, I have an email list and I'm always asking those questions. What can I do to better make the show for you? And what I did was I decided to set a filter that this would only go out to the last 10 people who signed up for my newsletter. And I wrote this email and said, hi, this is Dave. I'm working on the show and I'm always interested in your opinion on how I can make the show better. If there's anything you'd like me to talk about in the future, click the button below to schedule a 15 minute on um, meeting on Zoom. I can't wait to meet you. And I thought I would send this out to 10 people. I thought maybe four might reply and we'll see what happens. I click on send and it turns out that this went to everybody on my list. So it went to thousands of people and I was like, oh no. And then the meeting started coming in. So to make a long story short, for about two weeks every night, back to back to back to back to back Zoom meetings with people that listen to my show. Now, the beautiful thing is I would ask them two questions. I was like, what do you like about the show? Why do you listen? And they would say things, you know, oh, you're funny and I always learn something, whatever. And then this is the skill you have to, you have to work on this because it's hard to do. And then say, what do you wish I would do differently? Or is there something you would change about the show? And then you have to do this. Ready? Yeah, you have to shut up. You have to be ready for the awkward pause because they're going to go, no, I just, no, I, I love the show. Really? No. But if you really like, okay, but uh, you know, and if they give you anything, like I remember this one time, uh, the guy's like, ah, the thing you do with your cat, that kind of gets on my nerves. And I immediately grabbed a pen and pencil and was like, okay, great. Awesome. And my body language was I'm listening. And what you're saying is important. And I would write them down. And so it was great. I got great feedback on what was working, what they wish I would do more of. I would ask them about the length and things like that. So it's kind of silly to go, well, how do you know what your audience wants? In my case, I just asked them. I said, let's get on a Zoom call. And I also found out there are some people like in Oklahoma that had lots of guns in the back. And I'm like, whatever you do, don't make that guy mad. Holy cow. So it was great. And it was also in a way uh, kind of humbling because you know that I know that you know that I know that I'm just a dude in the spare bedroom. But to them, they're like, you're the host of my favorite podcast. So that was kind of a fun little ego stroke. But it was fun. So when in doubt, just ask your audience. It was a great mistake, and I plan on doing it again. Another way, uh, when it comes to growing your show, this is a report from Jacobs Media. And those top two tiers in blue all revolve around the same thing, and that is word of mouth. And so if you add those two together, that's 78% of new listeners come from people saying, hey, have you heard this show? It's all word of mouth. And so that seems to be true, even though this report, I believe, is from 2019. That is still true today. And so what podcasters are doing is they are basically pouring gas on that. If you think about it, when you go to YouTube, how many people, when you watch a YouTube video, they go, hey, Thanks so much for watching. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I don't know about you. I know what that red button in the bottom right-hand corner has been doing for years. I don't need somebody to tell me to like, subscribe, and ring the bell, but people do. So we should be telling people in our podcast, hey, if you like this show, and I just heard somebody do this, and I thought, oh, it was brilliant because it was even more specific. So let's say I'm Rob and Elsie on the feed. Instead of saying, hey, if you know someone who would like this topic, this person said, if I was maybe Rob, I could say, hey, do you, another, do you know another wannabe podcaster or a current podcaster who would like this topic? And somehow it triggered my brain to go, do I know any podcasters? Right? When you give them a specific, like, do you know somebody like this? And then you can say, 
do do they need to know this topic that we talked about in the episode? And then, of course, you send them back to your website where you have these follow buttons now on your website. And the key to this is you want to do it slowly, specifically, confidently, and you want to ask them to share the show with a friend because there's that share button right there on the phone. Or again, go to your website, not find me wherever you find podcasts. But what I hear, especially when it comes to the website, we know our website. We say it all the time. But we'll be like, hey, you know, like if if you know somebody who kind of like, I don't know, maybe what our, our website dot com. And you're like, wait, what was that? Dot com. How do you spell dot com? Right. They say it so fast because they know it. So say it slowly and clearly. And again, we're specifically telling them where to go. Go to mywebsite.com slash follow or just go to the website. Why? Because 78% of podcasts are discovered via word of mouth. And we're just politely reminding our audience to share it with a friend because we know that works. All right, let's, I'm going to take a quick break here before we get into interviews. I want to check the chat here. See what we've got. Are there any strategies? This was from Matt. Are there any strategies when you have content you're proud of and happy with and promotion, but growth slash listenership is plateauing, especially when you're in a category that's oversaturated? So are there any strategies, all of these strategies, really? The the great thing about that, thank you for the, the question, Matt, is when you think about that, uh, and Brian, I here we go, I can hide them, um, is... That's where newsletters come into play. I know I I am subscribed to the feed. It comes onto my phone automatically, and that will come out on like a Monday. And then I'll get the email from Elsie that says, hey, in this week's episode of the feed, we talked about blank. And even though I was going to listen to it later anyway, it might prompt me to go listen to it now, and then I can share it and put it wherever I want. So the other thing you have to keep in mind, especially when things seem to be flat, is, is there something I can do that other people are not doing? What can I do to stand out? And I realize that's a, uh, that's a really tough question to answer sometime. But is there something that other people aren't doing that my audience wants? Because sometimes it's not, you know, having your domain written in, in the clouds. It's not some big gesture. A lot of times the difference, back when I used to teach customer service classes, the difference between good customer service and great customer services is not great lengths. It's that little extra thing that nobody else is doing. And so just being a little different, maybe digging a little deeper, especially right now, uh, I am not, I need to figure out, like I like chat GPT, but I also know that chat GPT often gives you answers that are very uh, high level. They're, they're a mile wide and an inch deep. Right. So if I ask Chat GPT, hey, Chat GPT, how do I lose weight? It's going to go, Dave, you should eat less and exercise more. And I'm going to go, that's amazing. Holy cow. AI, are you kidding me? All right. That's a mile wide and an inch deep. Where the great thing about podcasting is you can be an inch wide and a mile deep because you're talking about that one subject that, like, I can't believe there's a podcast about Frisbee golf. Holy cow. And look, they go into the, the great details of this to where people are like, did, did you read my diary? How did you know I'm looking for this content? That's sometimes that will make you stand out. The reason I think podcasting is so popular is if you look at the late night shows, right? The Jimmy, Fa the Jimmies, we'll just say, and they do an interview and we just know that person's there to plug the movie or their TV show. And it's usually like, oh, so I heard you went on vacation with your family. And they tell, uh, uh, you know, a somewhat entertaining story and then it's roll the clip. Podcasting lets us go deep into a subject instead of like, oh, here's three easy questions and, and now let's plug your website. So figure out how can I be the utmost expert on this subject in my saturated, your word, market. So, and also when we see a lot of, like if we Google our topic, we Google, how fun is that? When we search our topic, in Apple Podcasts, and you're like, there are so many podcasts about golf. Oh my gosh, I was going to start a podcast. Look and see how many of those are still around. Because especially, there were a lot of shows started in 2020 when this little virus thing was rolling around that they're not doing podcasts anymore. So go look and see how many are still doing podcasts. But uh, thank you for the question, Matt. I appreciate that. 
and keep them coming. Be sure to put the little cue next to those. I'm going to stop every now and then and just take a peek. So let's talk about interviews. A lot of people think interviews are the, the holy grail. And really, let me, let me say that up front. When it comes to all of these ideas, none of them are the 10,000 download switch. When I find that idea, I will definitely pass it along. But most of them are, oh, this will give you a few here, and then you'll get a few over there. And if you have a swimming pool and you have one hose that's kind of just doing the trickle thing, all right, it's going in, it's going to take a while. But then you add another hose, and it's not a fire hose, but it's another like, all right, it's steady stream. When you More hoses fill the pool faster. So when you can pull some in from social media, which we'll be talking about here in a second, and a few more from that appearance on another show, and a few more over here, it fills the pool faster. So when it comes to interviews, interviews are great. The biggest takeaway from interviews is not the downloads. People overlook this. The biggest benefit of an interview is the relationship with that person. So let's say uh, I'm just going to keep picking on Brian from uh, the Cinema Psycho shows. He's our video guy, one of the guys you'll see on our YouTube channel. Like if somebody is like, let's say Brian goes on a show and Brian just, he's got two degrees in, in video and cinema and that whole nine yards. And then that same host interviews somebody else and they're like, yeah, I don't know if that would work with a video. That host is going to go, I know a video guy. I just interviewed him. His name's Brian. You got to check him out. It's the relationship you have with your guests and your hosts. That's really the bonus of interviews. I know we all are like, oh, and I want them to share it with their 8 million people on Instagram. Yeah, that's fine too. But that's one of the things you have to keep in mind. When you do interviews, let's talk about this where you're the host. We want people to share the show. And if you want people to share the show, you have to do a different interview than the last one. Um, because otherwise if you like, I, I, you know, there LC and I, we've been doing this a long time. And a lot of people ask me, what's, what was podcasting like back in 2005? I've told that story a million times and I will be happy to tell it again, but my audience has heard me tell that story a million times. So I'm probably not going to share that because my audience is going to go, oh, this again. So if you ask me some different questions to where it's a different interview, that my audience hasn't heard, but still delivers value to your audience, I'll be happy to share that. So keep that in mind. And I, I realize I just interviewed uh, Joe Polizzi last night from uh, Content Entrepreneurs Expo. He is the godfather of content marketing. And I did my best to come up with new questions, but I also wanted to ask him like the good old standard hits, right? Like how long does it take to grow an audience? So interviews are great, but the key here is you wanna do some research. I've seen people, I'm not making this up, go into Facebook groups and say, hey, I'm recording Thursday, I need a guest. And of course, we all say, well, what's your podcast about? And I honestly don't think they care. The criteria is a pulse. I need someone with a pulse and the ability to speak to come on my show. And that's not a great place to be. One of the things people always kind of uh, lose track of is, oh, I'm going to start a podcast and do interviews. And that's a fine strategy, but also do solo shows. When you do an interview show, it grows your network. When you do a solo show and you just talk to that invisible person right there and you say things like, hey, I'm so glad you tuned in. I'm so glad you're here. And you talk to one person, uh, that grows your influence. So you don't have to just do interviews. And if you do interviews, for those of you the, of you that remember, uh, there was a guy on the air for years named Jerry Springer, and he'd have people throwing chairs at each other and stuff, and they'd have all this chaos. And at the end, Jerry'd go, what did we learn today? And I always say, if you do an interview where you just made somebody look good for 20 minutes, at the end, now you get to subtly remind the audience that it is my show. And just go, what did we learn today? You know, we interviewed Brian, and he shared that story about the thing. That reminds me of a time, and now you share your personal story. So always do a Jerry Springer at the end of your interview show to, again, connect with your audience. But you want to do some research. And this is one of the things that can take some time with interviews because you want to make sure people are an absolute fit. So picture it this way. All right. I got a bookcase behind me. Let's say you're the bookcase. And instead of this, it's a soccer game. And I'm the goalie. All right. And you're behind me. My audience is behind me. And now I got some guests trying to just spew 
uh, about his new book or it's content that doesn't really resonate with my audience, as the goalie, you're going to go, mm -mm, not on my show. Nope, sorry. Oh, not in my house, right? You're just smacking all this boring content. No more boring. Nope, not going to. Nope, nope, nope. Well, if you're doing a lot of that, there's a thing. More planning equals less editing. Okay? Less planning, lots more editing. So do the research so that the people you're bringing on are not a, hmm, I think this person will be good. No, if you're, hmm, we don't want the, hmm, we want people going, oh, this is an absolute, this is going to be an amazing guest. We want to bring that person on. So do your research. Uh, and if you if you are in a case where you're like, mm, I think this person will be good, I always ask, can we do a pre-interview? And then even in a pre-interview, I'll go, hey, you know what? I think this is going to be amazing. And look, you don't really know me and I don't really know you. I just want to say this up front to make sure there's not a problem. In the event we do the interview and I don't think it delivers value to my audience, I reserve the right to not publish. Is that okay with you? And it's kind of a gutsy call, but if that person believes they are going to bring value to your audience, they'll be like, oh, that's perfectly fine. And so keep that in mind. And that's really, if we switch gears, how do I get on other people's shows? Make it personalized. I cannot tell you, I get at least probably five a week, really bad pitches because they're not personalized. It's just a form letter. And if I'm lucky, it'll say, hey, Dave, it'll be like, hey, podcaster. But I'll, I'll get them now. I'm like, hey, Dave, I love what you're doing over there on your show. And I'm like, really? Because I got four. Which one are you talking about? And again, it's it's very kind of almost like a chat GPT answer. It's high level with no detail. Love what you're doing over there with your show. Not like, oh, I listened to episode blah, 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 where you talked about such and such. That was a really good show. No specifics. Why? Because it's a form letter. And then there's 17 paragraphs about how great they are. None of it about how you I can help you serve your audience. And that's really what it boils down to. You want to help the podcast host serve their audience. That's what every good podcaster does. They serve their audience. And when you say, hey, I heard on episode 26, well, you talked about such and such. Uh, I'm a person that works in this field as well. Have you ever thought about doing an episode on blank? And are you currently looking for, uh, you know, um, interviews, interviewees or guests? And that's a great way to do it because you're you're not explaining how great you are because, you know, that can come up later. And hopefully you have a signature in your email that has a link to your website so they can click on it and go, oh, wow, this person looks like they'd be a great guest. So serve their audience and you will get more guests. Or so that you have a couple of different options here, right? Some people call it spray and pray. So you got your one letter that goes out to everyone. Hey, you're great. Love your show. Look how great I am. Spray and pray. Now that's super easy. Takes two seconds in an email list and off it goes. Or I got to do a little research and maybe I'm going to find five shows that I'm a really good fit and I'm going to make a personalized lesson or a personalized, uh, you know, email introduction on how I can help them serve their audience. You're probably going to get those people to bring you on the show. Now you might get some people with the spray and pray, but think about it. You just gave them a pretty bad pitch. So apparently they'll take anybody. Well, a podcast that takes anybody as a guest, how big is their audience going to be? Cause they're all over the place. These are the things you want to think about and really figure out what's your niche. Who are you trying to get in touch with? And be very specific. I know we keep going back to being specific, but it saves you time and it saves you hassle. All right. How are we doing on time? Perfect. Social media. This one is simple. Again, it's kind of a trickle. Uh, what you want to do, so we've got a row of ducks here and we're the first duck on the left and I want to reach that pink duck, right? So what do you do? Instead of saying episode 16 is out, well, A, nobody cares about episode 16, but if I say uh, Elsie Escobar makes a living with free software. Well, I'd want to click on that. So think of your tweet, your thread, whatever you're doing on Instagram as marketing material for, in this case, the person that's following us is the yellow duck. So I want to give them marketing material. Hey, do you know anybody that likes the Beatles? We talk about them in our latest episode. Well, then that person will share that with the person that's following them. 
to grow your audience, you want to get in front of people who don't know you. And so your followers do, but your followers' followers probably don't. So think of your tweets as marketing material or really just all your social posts. Guerrilla marketing. If you've never heard this phrase, it's unique, it's unexpected, sometimes humorous and cost effective, but you'd be surprised how often this again can bring in, it's like adding another hose to fill your pool. So one is play in traffic. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, when Robin Williams, the comedian died, everybody was talking about it. I was devastated. I'm a huge Robin Williams fan, but I do a podcast about podcasting. So I said, hey, Robin Williams passed away. He's one of my heroes. Here are some things that every podcaster can learn from. So number one, completely unique. Absolutely. Nobody like Robin Williams. So make your show unique. Uh, Multi-talented. So not only was he a great comedian, but he's a great actor. So maybe you could be a great storyteller and a great marketer. So it just went through. So I was talking about Robin Williams, but I was still talking about podcasting. So uh, I know Mark Marin uh, just re-ran an episode where Richard Lewis was on his show. Why? Because everybody's talking about Richard Lewis because unfortunately he passed away. So it's a case of, hey, everybody's talking about this topic. Let's talk about that. I know mom said, don't go play in traffic, but if there's a lot of people talking about a subject, is there a way that will naturally fit into your podcast to where you can get some of that traffic coming to you? Uh, I mentioned earlier your email signature. I am amazed at how many people have an email signature that does not have a link, at least to their website. And again, you could have a link there to follow the show on Apple and Spotify. Uh, I just checked before we did this webinar. It is the 20th as I record this. I think I have, I don't know, eight clicks of people clicking my link in my signature. It's super simple to set up. And why not? It's it, There are times when, you know, you get an email from somebody you don't know and you're like, who is this Dave Jackson? I don't know, whatever. And we click his website. Oh, I see he does podcasting. Get a link in your signature. It's an easy one. Make your audience a billboard. And so I know uh, Lipson has an Amazon store, but you could do a giveaway. Now, this is for, there are places, there's Tea Public, and I think a Teespring, and a here a tea, there a tea, everywhere a tea tea. There's tons of these places where you can order one t-shirt. Now, this is not a money-making thing because, because you're not ordering them in bulk. They're expensive. You know, it's like 18 bucks your price for the shirt. So if you marked it up, it'd be like 25. But you could have a giveaway. Hey, today we're going to spotlight the, the audience member of the month. They shared this tweet or whatever it is. You can make it a game if you wanted to. And the winner gets a custom-made T-shirt. And then you could just order this one T-shirt, ship it to them. You might want to throw in there a, a country limitation because I know right now if your winner was in Russia, it's illegal to ship things to Russia from the U.S. right now. So keep that in mind. Do a little thought about that. Uh, but you could turn your audience into a billboard to where now when they're walking around, they're promoting your show. I know one show that they do a lot of witty banter, shall we say, back and forth. And eventually they will have what I'm just going to call an audio meme. It's just some sort of running gag. And they started having their audience. They got their audience involved because they had the, some graphic artists make a T-shirt with the kind of audio meme on it. And it became like a badge of honor that they would go to different events and you could see, oh, you're a fan too because you've got the t-shirt on. So it'd be kind of this badge of honor to have the t-shirt. So that might be something you can do, not again so much as a money maker, although you you could try that, but just a badge of honor. You can get your audience in there to, uh, to do that. This one I pulled off from my days as a musician. My first podcast was for musicians and I was a musician. It was about how to get more gigs and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so back in the day, I had a custom CD printer that I could put CDs in. It had my logo. It said free music marketing tips. And it had about a three minute clip of all the people I'd interviewed on the show. And at the end, it said, what? That's right. Go to my website. And I went to where my audience was, which in this case was Guitar Center. That's where all the musicians went. And I would take a stack of 20 of these CDs and I would put them there. And I'd go back in a couple of weeks and I would see where most of them were gone. And so I'm like, well, that's great. But, uh, you know, CDs, well, Dave, uh, you know, 2004 called, they want their uh, media back. So I thought about this. You could make 
a Word document, you can go in. There's, again, plenty of places to make a QR code. I use that switchy tool. You could put your logo there. And then think about it. And, and again, this is so gorilla. But you could go into dentist office. You could go into doctor's offices. You could go in. I know every time I have my car worked on, they'll be like, oh, we'll have you in and out in 20 minutes. Three hours later, you know, and you're looking at the outdated magazines from, you know, 1994. You're like, yeah. Well, what if you had a little flyer there that said, bored? Point your phone at this. Again, not going to get you 10,000 downloads. You might want to talk to the store manager to make it sure it's okay. But if you're doing a local show, so let's say you're doing a show about, you know, Akron, Ohio, where I'm from. I could make this and say, hey, uh, point your phone at this to listen to the Akron podcast. And then just every grocery store that has a bulletin board, wherever you want, hang those up because you're just trying to get your brand out there. So that actually worked back in the day. I have not tried it in the digital format, but I was thinking about this. I'm like, well, they're trapped. There's no place to go. And they're getting upset. They need a way to blow off steam. Why not hang a flyer in a doctor's office? And then the thing to keep in mind when people go to your website, I see people that you go to the website, then you have to click on the word podcast, and then it brings up a bunch of, there's still no play button. So then you got to click on the second one, still no play button, but you got to scroll all the way to the bottom and then you can click on play. You might want to think about making it to where it's click play because if they have to keep searching, they're like, I don't know what this is going on here, but I can't find anything to listen to. Let's talk a little video podcasting. There are three types of video podcasts. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is Spotify. And so Spotify video podcasting, when you upload a video to Spotify, it goes to Spotify and only Spotify. Now, they will give you a feed. And so if you take that feed and put it into the other places, that feed only gets the audio. So the video only goes to Spotify. And sometimes you'll hear people talk about how sometimes Spotify feels like a walled garden because they make things that only work in Spotify. And this would be an example of that. The video only plays in Spotify. Now, from Libsyn, we can send them an audio all day long, but Spotify will not take video from anybody but their hosting. So that in that case, that video goes to one place, Spotify. The second form of video podcasting is YouTube. So you have YouTube podcasting and with Libsyn you can we can send your audio to YouTube as a video with a static image and then you can go into YouTube and make a playlist of those episodes and then you click another button on the playlist then you say I dub thee a podcast. And at that point it becomes a what I call a YouTube podcast. Because a YouTube podcast goes to YouTube and it goes to YouTube music. A Spotify podcast only goes to Spotify. Now, the other type of video podcast is the one that Libsyn does. And when you do this, we deliver things via an RSS feed. Libsyn is short for liberated syndication. And so there are 15 apps like Apple that will actually play the video. Then there are apps like Overcast, which is a popular iOS app. That's one of 22 that will play the audio. So that's uh, 37. And then there are 12 apps that if you send them a video, they're just going to go, ah, they don't know what to do with it. So they ignore it. So keep that in mind that if you want a true video podcast, you can do this on Libsyn. And if you've got the time and the budget, just make a video and throw it on YouTube. I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but it's free. And then again, you could go in and make it uh, a YouTube podcast and it would go to YouTube music. But for me, if I hear anybody say, hey, have you seen the video of, of the thing of the person that did the thing? I'm going to YouTube. I'm not going to these other platforms. If somebody says, watch this, I'm going to one place. So if you're making video stuff, by all means, YouTube is the number two search engine and it's great for discovery. I know a lot of people now are making shorts that point to their podcast because it's, again, just keeping your brand in front of them. But there are that's the three different ways, and it gets a little sticky because people go, I do a video podcast, and you kind of have to say, oh, which one? Spotify, YouTube po video podcast, or an actual video podcast, like the ones in the good old days with RSS feeds. So with that, another thing, business cards. I know you're like, ah, business cards, really? 2024, I got one right here, got my logo on the front. 
and the QR code on the back. And again, if somebody uses this QR code, I can see how many people did that. And it's worth paying the whatever it is, two cents for a business card. Because really what you're doing with business cards is you're kind of going, hey, can you throw this away later? And they go, oh, sure, thank you. But that's the thing. When they get home from the event and they're emptying out their, their cards, they might go, oh, yeah, I really wanted to talk to this person. So that's the beauty of a business card. As we uh, start to wrap up here, I'm going to hit some questions here in just a second. Some of these things you may try and they may not work. I know I have a show. I have a bunch of shows about podcasting. One of them does gangbusters in Spotify. The rest do not. So sometimes things, you know, if you're like, oh, well, Jill did this thing and it worked great for her. Just because it worked great for her doesn't mean it's going to work for your audience. Every audience is a little different. So some things may not work and that's fine. That's called a lesson, right? We talked about tracking what works and what doesn't. So you can do less of the stuff that doesn't work, but don't quit just because it didn't work doesn't mean that, uh, you know, oh, I'm just going to quit. That's not the way to do it. So let's go check the question queue here. I'm going to scroll down and do this proper. Here we go. And we have the, oh, here we go. we got another one from Erica. We have a medical podcast and a niche audience. Make sure that, and I didn't even mention this. This kind of goes without saying. Make sure you've gone into settings and then destinations and anything that says feed, make sure your show is there. Again, takes five minutes. And with a medical show, you really want to be in Ghana and GeoSavin. Those are India, and it's the top you know audio apps for India, and there's a lot of medical people in India. So we have a medical podcast and a niche audience. We have an engaged audience but need to monetize. Any suggestions? Uh, I will not plug my book. I'm not going to plug my book. Uh, we have a website and a league magnet. So uh, that's a great question. So here's, we'll, we'll answer this question. Uh, how how do you monetize your show? And there are a couple ways. The number one most profitable way, selling your own product or service. So coaching, um, books, courses, whatever, selling your own stuff. Why? Because people know, like, and trust you. So when you say, hey, I got this new thing coming out, they go, oh, I love your stuff. And they go and buy it. There's that. There's affiliate marketing where you are selling other people's stuff, but you get a commission for that. And the right product with the right audience, that can pay really, really well. When I was doing my musician podcast, I had an affiliate account with Audible, and I already had an audience that liked to listen to stuff. And Sammy Hagar came out with a book, and I made, I think it was $15 for every person that I referred to a brand new. And that was a nice little check. So the right product for the right audience, affiliate marketing can do. Then you get into host red ads. That's if you have around 10,000 downloads an episode. That's where you get the Casper mattress and all the other big ads. Then you get into crowdfunding. There are people that are absolutely crushing it with things like Patreon. And there are, again, a bunch of different services that do that kind of stuff. Uh, but keep in mind, with any kind of crowdfunding, A, crowd. So you need a crowd. And then about 3% of your audience is going to sign up for that. And I hate that stat, that it's only 3%. But when I talk to people like Thinkific and Teachable and other people that I interviewed about monetizing, they were saying like uh, Radio Lab was trying to get up to 1%. So crowdfunding, you're going to get a small amount of those people. So there's that. And then donations, uh, you can have, you know, buy me a coffee and things like that. Uh, and then if you are, if you're working in the Bitcoin space, uh, go over to, uh, we'll just Google value for value Bitcoin podcasting, because you can actually have people stream Bitcoin to you. So that's another way to make money with your podcast. The other thing you have to do is ask for it. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had somebody that does speaking and I listened to her podcast. I helped her launch it. She'd done it for about six months. And I said, Hey, how's your podcast going? And she's like, it's going great. It's like, my numbers are going up great. She's like, but I'm not getting any speaking gigs. And I said, I've known you for almost a year. You do speaking gigs? And she goes, yeah. And I go, I've never heard you mention that. And she said, I kind of feel salesy when I do self-promotion. And you have to let people know uh, that you have things for sale, but it doesn't have to be this Sunday, Sunday, Sunday kind of thing. You could simply say, I was speaking to a bunch of kids in the Bronx last week, uh, a bunch of high school kids. And this young man came up to me and asked me a question. 
And I thought, you know, that'd be a great topic for a podcast. There you go. That was your ad. It doesn't have to be this, this blatant ad. So uh, you might also, if you, you know, uh, going back to Erica's question, if you have a bunch of medical people, the last time I heard Big Pharma likes to advertise their products because I see them all the time on TV. Maybe there's some sort of uh, product that they have that might fit your audience. It really goes back to uh, your audience and, and who's listing and solving their pains and things like that. So those are all the different ways that you can monetize, but you do have to ask. So many people, uh, I just had somebody last night and I said, at the end of his show, he was asking for ratings and reviews. And I'm like, yeah, but why are you doing the podcast? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to position myself as an expert. I'm like, well, I didn't get that. And again, didn't want to feel salesy. Y you have to be realize that um, you're not you're not selling yourself. You're helping your audience solve a problem. That's what you do if you're selling your own products or services. So why you're stopping yourself from helping your audience and saying, hey, if you need help with whatever it is you you know have an expertise in. I can help. Here's my website. Click here and let's do a quick discovery call. But I realize a lot of people have a hard time doing that. So thank you for the question, Erica. I appreciate that. One more time around the chat here because I realize we're up against time and I want to respect you all. But don't forget that we have a bunch of stuff coming up on the YouTube channel. We got Tangia, Renee, Estrada tomorrow. We've got the uh, the YouTube. If you haven't, uh, again, Elevating your podcast with YouTube. Go over and register for that. That's April 11th at 2 p.m. Lots of things going on over there at our YouTube channel. So if you started in the middle of this and you're like, hey, did you guys record this? Yes, we always record it. This will be on our YouTube channel later. But uh, the awesome Libsyn team is putting all the links there in the chat room as well. I appreciate you all taking time out of your day to uh, come and listen to me and, and network together here in the chat room. It's always fun hanging out with podcasters that all have the same idea, the same. We all want to grow our audience. We all want to change the world one download at a time. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come listen. So thank you so much. Uh, and you know, like, subscribe, ring the bell. I got to say that because it works if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, we'll see you again real soon with another fun way to help you grow your audience here from Libsyn. Take care, everybody.